Hello and welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Club. I'm Alice Eady and as always I'm joined by the gorgeous Jessamy G. Hey Alice, how you going? I'm so good, Jess. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm so happy to be here today with our beautiful guests. Yeah, likewise. We've been having so many good chats, just laughing and setting up the sound. We are joined today by the incredible, talented, brilliant Natalie Mather, an artist and a painter and just one of the most well-spoken, generous, interesting creatives working in, in Melbourne and Australia at the moment. Natalie, Thank you for being here. Well, gosh. <laughs> no pressure. Thank you. I don't feel pressure. I just feel sort of flushed and nice and fuzzy. Thank Aww. you. That's beautiful. Yay. Yeah. So we're going to kick off without any further ado, the way we always mm-hmm. do, which is asking you to please read your bio for us. Sure. So we were just briefly chatting about this before we started recording. And I was saying that I have a statement and a bio that are really sort of markedly different and they have different kind of aims, I guess. Um, I'll read like the intro to my statement. I don't want to like go on for too long. (laughs) Um, Go on for as long as you want. All the space. Nothing but time. (laughs) Nothing but time. Great. Um, So the statement begins with, for a long time, I suspected that the paintings I made were rooted in a desire to transform or be transported from the constraints of consensus reality. Painting provided both the means and destination for my imaginative and cognitive transportation. I attempt to create a dazzling variety of spatial and relational possibilities. Science fiction books, films and virtual reality experiences scaffold my exploration, allowing me to speculate on how painting can heighten the present moment while simultaneously transporting us elsewhere. So the statement is really kind of oriented towards trying to get people immediately on board with paintings that they might find kind of complex to access visually. Um, Whereas the bio (laughs) feels a lot like a, like a corporate exercise in a lot of ways. (laughs) Can Can I just check? So, so do you think of just in terms of the difference between a bio and an artist statement, And I'm asking this completely selfishly because after God knows how many years of like three different art schools, I still don't know what the fuck the difference between those things is. Sure. Is your bio you and the artist statement your work? Yeah. So the statement is really like, what am I, what am I aiming for when I make work? Like what's the goal? And when you look at my work, how can I clarify that process and those goals for someone who might not necessarily be able to figure that out by looking at it. Um, they might, I find a lot of people have a bit of a, a sense of what an artist is trying to do. And then the statement is kind of holding their hand and allowing them to speculate a little bit more. So it's not prescriptive, it's open, but it, gives them a a bit of a I think it's like a scaffolding yeah, to understand like what a, you're about. Like a guide without being like you said yeah. without dictating their experience. It's something Yeah, it's like a little map, I guess. Yeah. Um whereas the bio is really like perfunctory. I I I think um, you know, who are you? What have you done? <laughs> why why do you deserve to be here? <laughs> 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 um, Um, and so where, so uh, this is like, I don't even know that an artist statement is a thing that exists, not existing (laughs) in this world. I'm like, oh, it's all news to me. Um, and where does that, where do you use that? Like, is that something you send to Mm -hmm. galleries? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So normally it will accompany any, uh, avenue where I'm showing my work. So that might be a prize or an exhibition or, um, or just applying for grants and opportunities, um, I'll use the statement. Um, I revise the statement probably every six months. Hmm. Um, I can't revise it for every single application because that's madness. Yeah. Um, whereas, yeah, the bio is definitely aimed more at just opportunities uh, that are maybe more kind of commercially oriented or, or professionally um, advantageous. Mm. Can, yeah. can we hear the bio? I was about to say, yeah, you're not off the hook, by the <laughs> <Sure>. way. <Yeah. laughs> they 
Damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Natalie Mather, oh, that's the other thing. It's also in third person, but the, the other one isn't. Yeah. Um, Natalie Mather is a Melbourne-based painter. She considers her works as small worlds or imaginary geographies of her own invention. Drawing from various sources, narrative works, science fiction, geological imagery and historical architecture to build her fantastical visions, Mather has an unabashed love of colour and she takes huge influence from the visual language of 1980s pop culture and design. Born out of nostalgia for the bright and garish aesthetics she grew up with and around. Graduating from the ANU School of Art in 2009, Mather worked in Canberra, Newcastle and Berlin before settling in Melbourne in 2014. Natalie has been a finalist in prizes such as the Churchy, Fisher's Ghost Art Award and the Macquarie Emerging Art Award. She collaborated with New Agency on a mural commission for Mars Gallery and Stonington Council in 2020 and her work was featured in Art Edit magazine's One to Watch. Natalie completed a Master of Fine Art Research at the Victorian College of the Arts in 2021 and was a recipient of the Carolyn and Hans Varney Prize. She was a finalist in the Bayside Acquisitive Art Award in 2022 her work is held in private collections in Australia and internationally. Oh, shit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me sound good, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sure does. How sure did we does. book this interview? <laughs> <laughs> How did it That's feel to read so that? so funny. <laughs> oh, it, it, God, it feels like it feels like there's such a kind of alignment between myself and my statement, whereas and I guess this is the topic of the podcast, whereas the bio feels somewhat uh, like slightly sort of misaligned with who I feel I am. So it mm. <laughs> presents me very professionally and as a high achiever and I'm like, do people know that I just sit around in my pyjamas? <laughs> Should I add that in? <laughs> and the answer to that probably is no, they don't. But now they, no, they do. <laughs> Welcome to my secret. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting though, I think, because you've obviously, you're obviously a writer, right? Like you've got mm. a, you're a beautiful writer. And even though like, yes, particularly towards the the latter part of the bio, it's more a list of achievements. You still manage to weave in something that I do actually think sounds like you. That's a bit less like corporate and starting out with like, Born in 1985, doesn't yeah. really, like, you know what I mean? Like it does have a little bit more kind of flavour to it than a lot mm. of bios or like, you know, than my bio, for example, that's just very like dot point lists, very little personality. Very I should clear. probably revise that, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, yeah, and so while like a lot of that comes through in your artist statement, I feel like it does still come through a bit in your bio too. Mm, that's really nice. Yeah, it feels nice to have a bit of or more comfortable to have a bit of a lead in Um about what I'm interested in um, just makes it all feel a little more authentic. How do you, like, how do you think about the relationship between your writing and your creative painting practice? Because it feels, at least from the outside and, and having heard you read those, it they feel very kind of mutually informative. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that how you work or is it kind of, does the writing happen after the painting reflecting on it or, or are they happening sort of at the same time informing each other? Mm, always simultaneously. Um, so I've had a, a, a poetic practice for a long time. My other undergraduate degree was in creative writing. So they, they have always kind of sat by side by side and I've had a, um, a journaling practice since I was a little kid like in a very dedicated one so writing is something that happens almost every day and painting is something that happens almost every day and they may not necessarily touch each other but one each one gives me space to think about the other and in so doing they kind of become intertwined um, or interrelated have you always yeah. been very disciplined around daily kind of practices for writing for painting is that is that just part of who you are or is that something you've learned as you become mm. a professional creator? Good question. Um, I think I've learned over time. I think during my undergrad, um, because I was doing the two degrees simultaneously, I had to learn time management very, very quickly. Um, and I realised that that was probably the only way I was ever going to be a professional creative was balancing 
competing interests, so ways of making money and ways of creating and that I'd have to actually continue that um, that dedication to doing everything every day, otherwise everything would come apart. <laughs> and sometimes it does come apart and that's okay. Um, I've learned that that's okay probably only in the last few years, that sometimes you can just let it all go and it will come back. Um, but for the most part, yeah, having daily practices or really uh, I think my supervisor, uh, Lisa Radford, called me a nine-to-five painter and I think that it's probably more of a 12-to-four painter, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but having having the practice every day stops me from ever questioning whether it's a, a priority. There's like there's no oh, room. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, th- there's no room to to put it off because there's no questioning it. It's like if you wore a grey T-shirt every day or whatever, you just that's what you do. Yeah. Like taking away that sort of decision fatigue thing of like will I paint today? It's just like no, that like I brush my teeth every morning, mm. I paint and I'll write every day. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Is there any, so you're you're creating work professionally as your job, as your thing, as your career, is there any separation between stuff that you do just for like joy and self-expression and the stuff you do for work? Or, I mean, even if it's not that the output is any different, but um, I guess maybe around like the intention for it, like on some days, is it like I'm just playing and other days it feels like I'm at my job? Um, I think I'm always just playing, to be honest. Oh, um, ideal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why I'm not like... Um, you know, I sit at a certain professional level of, of artist and it's not, I'm not churning out a million works for a commercial space or whatever, because that would place pressure on my process that I think would result in work that was kind of poorly executed or work that Mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily want out in the world. So Mm -hmm. I'm happier to always be consistently playing and that usually results in a fairly consistent, fairly robust um, body of work and with a few failures along the way and I'm comfortable with that. I have so many questions to ask about this because, (laughs) and again, completely selfishly, like I'm sitting at this point in in a career where I think when you're younger, or or I can only speak for myself, when I was younger it felt like there was kind of one route to being an artist, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like at some point you get signed to a gallery and from there, you just make art for the rest of your life and, and it mm. kind of works. And and growing up, realising that there are so many ways to engage with that creative field and kind of finding that space to let go maybe of, of what old ideas of what I thought success would be oh my God, and finding new things. Yeah, no, just hearing you say that because it's like, and I, and I mean, this is, I guess, really vulnerable terrain and like anything you don't want to talk about we can just cut out or or whatever I love this (laughs) but like just that just the idea of day jobs like I found Mm. if if there has been one takeaway for me personally from going back to do a master's in fine arts hasn't actually been anything about art that I've learned it's about seeing 15 or 20 other smart interesting creative weird souls but also the fact that everyone has a day job yeah, and that that's not failing. Like no. there's this, there's this sense of like finding a way to do what you need to do to live. And then like mm. you say, like it frees you up to fuck around and like experiment and make work that remains conceptually interesting to you rather than work that's a product because yeah. your rent relies that, on it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, God, I think about this all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, part of it, I guess, is that um, there was a period in my sort of mid to late twenties um, when I was uh, sort of newly married and and no, no longer married and <laughs> and snap. kicking around <laughs> snap um, and kicking around the the country and I didn't have a lot of money and what I learned from that was even though I technically had all the time in the world to work on my practice that I personally can't focus and make good work without some baseline level of financial assurance. Yeah. I, you know, if I'm anxious about paying rent, I can't paint. I can't, you know, I can't, um, can't approach my work in a kind of open and generous way and give it time because there's always this kind of 
burgeoning seed of desperation behind mm-hmm. it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that was the first lesson that I had in undoing and pulling apart all of those notions of success, like that success would mean that I would make my work full time. And I, I now realise that for me, work, my work is best when everything around it feeds into it and there has to be multiple mm-hmm. things feeding into it, um, including my day job and including just having a steady income, but also all of the incidental things that you witness and learn doing other things. Yeah. Um, and so that has become a kind of marker of success for me is having things in balance but also having a very kind of diverse, uh, how to put it, like have my day and my weeks and my months look different and and part of that is writing and painting um, but also part of that is hiking and part of that is having a day job and it all kind of feeds together and that's successful to me. Like success is much more holistic Yeah, as an idea. That's, you know? yeah, that's a really, in- and it's actually a, um, a side of that coin I hadn't really thought about that much. Um, like obviously there's the financial security, like you need to, as you said, like be able to pay your bills or mortgage or rent or whatever. Um, and like we spoke about um, on another episode, like it's not that money buys you happiness, but a mm-hmm. lack of money sure can buy you a whole lot of unhappiness and, yeah. and discomfort and unsafety. Um, unsafety? Yeah. Unsafety. Yeah. It works, works there. Okay. Yeah. We're, go- we're going yeah. with it. <laughs> um, but it's interesting as well, like looking at it from the perspective of not just like, okay, cool, like having that safety there mm-hmm. so you've got a base to work off, but also as an artist, you need inputs from all sorts of different, um, you know, walks of life and categories of things. It's like, you know, the classic thing of the awkward second album for bands because it's always about touring and like, you know, <laughs> like, oh, we got so big and now we're on tour and it no longer <laughs> is relatable because their life has changed so much as a result of, you know, maybe they had this um, you know, they connected to a big audience because they were talking about their lives with all of the inputs that they've got from their mm. day jobs, hobbies, you know, other networks, all that stuff. But when that becomes the only thing that they're doing, yeah. suddenly, you know, that's why there's often that drop because it's not relatable anymore. It's music about making music. Mm, which, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. is, is a niche audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and similarly, yeah, it, it can become art about making art, which again interests some people. Mm. Um, but for me, uh, external inputs are really critical, like reading and, and watching, you know, odd films and things like that is a huge part of my practice. Like I spend a lot of time digesting things. So are you quite, um, like when you say, I think it's really interesting and, and I'd love you to like unpack that more, this idea of like that reading or watching a weird film is part of your practice or you spoke about like hiking earlier. Mm. I just think it's really interesting that that is, that the way you frame that is part of the work. Mm. Like that's not ancillary to it or like, so like that is the work itself. And I think that it's a really useful way to think about that because I think when people don't, it's like you've got the work, which is the actual labor of some kind of creation. Mm -hmm. And then now trying to find other time to do the things that enable that, like that you've created like another whole category of efforts. Like, yeah, yeah. can you maybe chat a bit more just about the kind of the work around the work? Around working, sure. And firstly how you think about it, but then also like what kind of things you do to feed your creative soul. Um, Well, I think it does go back to this idea of, of now viewing artistic or creative success as this kind of bigger picture. Um, so during the masters that I just finished that Alice is still doing, <laughs> um, oh God, <laughs> um, it gets better. Um, <laughs> um, I really had to kind of grapple with, you, you know, I've been making work for such a long time and I knew the kind of work I made, but I was like, why the hell am I making it? Like what actually interests me about my own work why do I do it um and then I that was where this idea that really I am interested in all forms of kind of um imaginative 
escapism of like world building of building maps and spaces and structures that don't make sense but sit inside a kind of odd cognitive realm and to make work that is geared towards like over the course of my entire lifetime realizing that desire or realizing those goals is now my kind of metric for success and so as part of that it's always been really it's always been really important to me to watch and read things that have a similar kind of effect. Um, and I didn't really link all of those things together until the last few years. I was like, oh, yeah, like had this kind of lifelong obsession with The Wizard of Oz or with, um, you know, surrealism, uh, surrealist film, I should say, um, or old sci-fi films and all of these things where the world is highly speculative and imaginatively kind of um, strange or blown out of all sense of normal proportion or um, is full of juxtapositions. And so it was then about much more, having a much more targeted approach um, to reading and uh, ingesting all of those kinds of inputs and materials, like reading more books that were more specifically about creating different worlds or, or existed in different worlds or once I had that realisation. Um, so as part of my practice, I read a lot more speculative fiction now. I've kind of made that connection. It's yeah. like it's not incidental anymore. It's it more... sounds like you're almost being a detective of your own brain. Yeah, it feels kind of forensic yeah. in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, also just you know, having this realisation that, that, that this, that success for me is lifelong and is this kind of lifelong endeavour and it's evolving um, meant that I had to kind of get much clearer on what drove me to make work mm. now and what, what things do I love in the world that have make me aspire to be a better artist and those things aren't necessarily paintings, other people's paintings. They're like things like um, Invisible Cities, Italo Calvino, um, that makes me want to be a better painter, oddly. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So. And that, so. that uh, forensic detective experience when you started noticing these patterns, was there a particular practice that got you there? Was that through your journaling or through therapy or is there a certain thing that led to noticing those patterns? I think it was definitely writing and having yeah. to have the the practice of writing about my work through my master's um, and noticing because even from the beginning of the master's I made sure that I kept a kind of weekly journal of things I was looking at, things I was doing, and then I was like, oh, this is actually I'm, I'm really – not as complicated as I thought I was at all. <laughs> it's all the same thing. <laughs> My supervisor described it as a dog. He's like, artists are like dogs with their vomit. Like they, they're obsessed. <laughs> they're obsessed with one thing and they'll like walk away for a bit, but they'll come back. Come they back just keep it. coming back to the same fucking thing. They can't resist. <laughs> and it's so true though. Like, I don't know many artists who are genuinely like, like oh this thing oh this thing and the and those things are not actually connected yeah if you zoom out enough there there'll be a through line or it's kind of that mm. that um saying like all directors make the same movie again and again and again <laughs> well they're all trying to make a particular movie over and over <laughs> yes. again I think that's yeah. that's part of it too it's like I'm always trying to make I mean I'm always trying to make a painting I've never seen before um it that. doesn't remind me of anything. Um, Has it always been painting for you? No, not at all. Um, so I, <laughs> I fell into painting kind of accidentally, um, which is a bit strange. Um, I, growing up, I was going to be a musician and a writer um, and that was my goal. And then when I was about 16, I developed pretty bad stage fright um, and I started focusing on art more in high school. Um, and I just had this fantastic art teacher, yay for good teachers, um, called Peter Ayland. I am going to mention her yeah, name. There we go. We'll say. do that. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Shout Ayland, um, who encouraged me to continue my art practice. And so I applied to art school 
um, much to the surprise and probably muffled horror of my parents. Um, and I remember when I applied, they said, oh, look, for your interview, you know, you have to interview for particular disciplines. And they were like, what do you do? And I was like, uh, painting and drawing and just said it like that. And I'd never really painted. And <laughs> I just didn't know what to say. And they put that in preferentially. So they were like painting first, oh, drawing second. Um, so I rocked up to my art school interview aged 18, um, 17 actually, um, with a bunch of drawings to the painting department. And they were like, do you paint? And I was like, not yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just happened to get in. So I spent probably the first two of five years really struggling to learn how to paint, um, which I feel like set me up with the really kind of dogged, relentless approach to painting yeah. that I have where I do it all the time. Was um, there ever a point you, <coughs> excuse me, where you were just going to throw in the towel like a year into uh, that, just be like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, the first couple of years just all of the time I was like, why am I doing this? Like everybody else mm. has gone to art school because it's the thing they know how to do and I've gone to art school to learn how to do it. Like this is, I've yeah. so on the back foot. And then at about, yeah, in about the third year I started to, it all started to click and I realised that I really loved it and then by the time I finished honours it was a bona fide addiction and and now, yeah, I mean, there's just something so satisfying about painting, about colour, about the texture, about the practice that, I mean, you know, I'm interested in doing other things but painting's sort of at its core. That is a really interesting thing. Again, a kind of angle I hadn't thought of before. Like you should be going to a learning institution to, <laughs> to learn something. <laughs> you know what so. I mean? Like you, like you said, you're like, I already know how to, like obviously there's a lot of learning that comes from mm. them. But um, if people aren't learning to paint at art school, where the fuck are they learning to paint then? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if that door's not open for you, if you're like, this is the thing I want to learn, they're like, nope, you must already know how to do <laughs> that have it. in order to learn how to do that. That's it. And I mean, <laughs> this was, sense. this would have been like. Wait a minute, weird. we're being had. <laughs> <laughs> not a learning institution at all. <laughs> and I mean, in the mid 2000s, I feel like there was still very much this kind of like artistic mm -hmm. skills are inborn like mm. idea, this very fixed yeah. mindset idea. Um, and to like launch myself into that as somebody who was like, maybe it's a practice. Maybe you can learn how to do it felt was extremely vulnerable and quite hurtful at different points as well. Cause it took a while to get any good at it at all. <laughs> um, and I, I'm really pleased to say that I feel like that's shifted a lot in the last 20 years. Yeah, that's a very brave thing to do at 18 too because I feel like I have very recently started <laughs> to work some of this shit out. So to have the, um, firstly, the courage to th throw your hat in the ring and do it, but secondly, the, what, like the grit to stick it through, through all of the, I imagine, ups and downs and, and complexities mm. that come with that, the fact that you you stuck it through and now it's, you know, I yeah, that's I quite remarkable actually. I, yeah, I think it was probably more, more naivety than bravery. Honestly, I just don't think I really knew what I was doing. I just left home. Both effective. Floating, yeah. Both yeah. effective, right? <laughs> you're sort of like, you're naive until you figure it out. And then you're like, oh, that was, wow, I did that. Um, but also I think from memory, I ended up with some kind of scholarship and so I couldn't quit <laughs> just like oh, my option of quitting was taken away from me I was like I can't actually afford to go to uni if I don't have this and I have to do it um so sometimes these I love that some of these external constraints which can feel quite chafing um kind of especially when you're young and you you kind of feel like you could flit off and quit anything these external constraints kind of hold you to your commitments and that gives, I mean, I feel like that gave me a pretty good baseline for understanding what can come of sticking to a commitment even mm. when it's terrible for ages. It, it almost forces you to kind of work through that Dunning-Kruger, like the the spike of like thinking you're amazing because you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> then you get into the dip of like you learn what you're talking about and you're like, oh, I suck. I'm yeah. fucking bad at this. Yeah. 
And then that's where you want to fall off. But the kind of structure is such that it holds you in place. And Funnels it's like, if you, you can, yeah, yeah. If you can just keep showing up past that point when you really don't want to, because it does not feel good mm. at that stage. Yeah. Um, is like, it, it is a gift, but also to kind of, it's interesting to hear you name that as well. Like to be able to see that in your own pathway, I think is, is pretty amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It just, I think it's just one of those good accidental lessons um, because nobody's good at anything when they start it. I've started a lot of things in my life and I've been pretty (laughs) terrible at most (laughs) of them. Um, But, yeah, so it's good to sort of have the the experience behind it. Are there ways that like either external or self-imposed constraints come up in your creative practice? Because obviously that, I mean, and, constraints can be incredible I think for creativity like even just thinking about um you know the pandemic and the things that came out of that on an individual level in terms of like well fuck how do I suddenly do my job virtually without other people and all the you know technological and other um things that came out of it um and so that's something that you found to be really valuable in terms of your you know like learning about hard work discipline whatever Is it something that you also find pops up in your painting itself or your creative practice now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I feel like I, unless I'm actually talking to artists, when I'm talking to people who, uh, I had an interview recently with some engineering students and they were really disappointed by how boring I am as an artist. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, because I think they, they looked at my work as part of their sort of background research um, and then they were like, tell us about, you know, what you do. And I was like, all right, well, I get there at this time and I work for this amount of time. And and if it's, you know, if I'm feeling under the weather or it's whatever, then I sit down and I draw for this amount of time. And it's really, my whole practice is, necessarily predicated on on discipline on constraints and that's Mm. the the older I get the more complicated my life gets the more I like cling to those constraints like Mm. a life raft because they give Mm. me the time and space to make anything at all even if it's less than maybe what I used to make um I found that this this year uh, my partner and I have been looking after his 12 year old daughter full-time and she's beautiful and just you know a joy um but every adjustment or or difference in my life like that as I get older means that I need I need constraints I need self self self-imposed constraints because external constraints will come and swoop in and commit my time for me if Mm. I'm not ready to defend my time like yeah. a, like an angry crow. Yes. <laughs> I would imagine also, um, and again, this is this is really personal and like by all means tell me to fuck off. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but, um, but I would like how is the process of of thinking about your time when you're becoming when you start sharing parenting duties with a partner but you're you're coming to those parenting duties sort of along the timeline so so it's mm. like your your induction into that i would imagine is very different to if if you kind of like go through some of those life transitions you know like if if someone's pregnant they've got 9 months to think about a change that's going to happen and yeah. they've got a baby they've got kind of like that time to think about what it's going to mean so but true. if you join that a bit further along the line like you uh, how how do you adjust <laughs> yeah it's so true that. I always imagine if you know you're pregnant you've got time to kind of uh, cement your your kind of personal principles about how you're going to go yeah. about it and sure they might be blown up but you've thought about um what you can put in place to make your artistic practice work yeah. for you as your your other child um and yeah with this I mean it ha- it's happened very slowly and very deliberately slowly um, so I lived in a share house for the first two, two and a half years that we were together and, and that worked really well as a way of kind of dipping my toe into being a part of this child's life and this partner who had a kid um, half of the time. And that made me realise over time that I probably was capable of committing myself more to to this little 
little family. Um, and then we moved in together, but we only had her half of the time. And so again, that's like a, an adjustment, but every second week I could be like, man, mm. I'm just going to make art for a week. And then next week's like intensive child week and we'll hang out. And then having her full time this year has been, <laughs> I think I was a little naive about how that was all going to work out, but, um, because I want to, you know, there, there's this whole thing you learn as an artist where you are constantly kind of nurturing your practice. Your practice needs attention. It needs um, needs to hit developmental milestones. <laughs> <laughs> so advanced. So I think advanced it might be for gifted. Age. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm going to send my painting practice to a Steiner school. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> they definitely will not let you use your color palette at the Steiner School. <laughs> so I just true. <laughs> That's so true. It's a very niche reference, but <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to the three people listening. Who got it. Um, <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> I barely I was just got like, it. Ah. <laughs> Thought I'd better come clean. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, and and yeah, and so I and similarly, there's this kid in my life now, and a partner who I want to dedicate time and attention to as well. So it was kind of like, oh, okay, I actually kind of have to do all of that without losing my sense of self and my my discipline and my sense of the importance of my own time and attention. Mm-hmm. Um, Still navigating that. Don't have any answers. Um, <laughs> I thought we were going to crack the crack the code. Big question yeah. of parenting. <laughs> like I think the big question of parenting is just keep making it up until it <laughs> yeah. vaguely works. Um, and I mean, I, as you say, I'm not I'm not a parent, so I do have the luxury of being like cool. So you do that, and I'm going to the studio <laughs> um, if I really need to. But yeah which helps. Isn't it funny how you, like, it's not, well, I don't know, for me, it wasn't until I was a young (laughs) adult that you're like, oh, hang on a minute. They were just fucking making this up the whole time. (laughs) Completely. (laughs) They didn't know what they were doing. (laughs) They were just two humans. (laughs) At some point they were young. (laughs) With lives. Or especially now getting to the phase where I'm I what blows my mind is looking back at pictures of my parents as young parents and realizing that I'm older than them. Yeah. Same. Oh, wow. And yeah. like that. So now not only are they young, which already I'm like, they can't be young. They were ancient always. <laughs> yeah. But like, firstly, I get my head around that. And then the fact that not only were they young, but they're like younger than me. Oh. And like if I met that person on the street, like that would be a young parent. Like, you, yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, that's a lot. I, both my parents are older parents. I'm sort of this love child slash afterthought, um, which is fine by me. So I'm now at the stage where I'm like, oh, they sort of made a last-minute decision to have me around the age I am now. I'm like, oh, interesting. Um, but you're right, it's like, but at the same time, yeah, our parents, I love my parents, they're shambolic. Like, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Of course. Especially if you've got a little Jessamy G, or I don't know about a little <laughs> Natalie as a teenager, but you've just got to improvise. <laughs> That's it. Um, I think because I grew up on like a little hobby farm and stuff, they were oh, kind of you? like, do you know where she's gone today? No. Oh, sure, she'll be back. Because <laughs> I was just going to run off. and Yeah, what was, yeah. The, what was the kind of vibe growing up? Because just kind of looping back to earlier when you mentioned the kind of difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset and how Mm. almost like coming to painting late, you almost had different expectations on yourself. Like you were not there to like prove your innate identity. Mm. You were there to learn a skill and that kind of opened up a lot more possibilities versus the other way kind of tends to shut down possibilities. Possibilities. Like, Mm. is that something that you, did you grow up in a home where you feel like that was taught or was that something that you kind of happened upon along the way? Mm. I mean, yeah, so I grew up in a a tiny town called Hay, um, which is about 2,000 people um, in the middle of the Hay Plains. So that's like just sort of flat expanse for as far as the eye can see. And I had a very kind of wild and rambunctious, very free 
childhood, which I am extremely grateful for. Um, and I think and my parents are like extremely loving, but both my siblings were grown up and so they sort of focused their attention on me and developing particular skills that I sort of maybe nascently had. So like I would, although um, they sort of served their own agendas as well. (laughs) I I remember the first time I brought home a picture of a horse that I'd drawn and rather than like, I would have been in primary school and rather than encouraged the drawing, they got me a horse (laughs) (laughs) because my mum wanted someone to ride with. (laughs) She was like, oh, great. (laughs) We can filter this one of many ways and we're going to choose to read it as um, a a budding young (laughs) horse woman. It's a request. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it's a request. Um, But I think like both of them grew up in rather hard childhood, had rather hard childhoods and were really determined to be as kind of different from their own parents as they could be. And for my mum that meant not imposing her anxieties about failure or anything onto me. So they were very, maybe not consciously, but they encouraged me to do a lot of activities where I I did have to do them badly Mm. first. So, you know, horse riding or... Um, or dancing or or learning musical instruments and things like that. I had to be pretty god-awful for a while. Mm. Um, And so in a way, yes, they did kind of encourage the idea that you get better only through practice and discipline. Um, Not sure how grateful I was for that (laughs) (laughs) at the time after falling off my horse for the hundredth time. You're like, I just wanted some crayon. I know. Hector was a request for crayons, (laughs) not a pony. My mum's like, get back up. You'll be right. (laughs) I think it is such a gift to give kids the space to be bad at stuff. Like Mm. really like, yeah, it's such a and not give up yeah, when they're bad at it. Yeah, I think. it's fine. Like I think this all the time with people who stop drawing. It breaks my heart. Like hearing oh. people don't draw, and then the reason they'll give you is like they're not good at it. Yeah, You're like there's a no such thing reason not to draw. Yeah. yeah, no such thing as bad at drawing. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> like yeah, I agree. There yeah. is a there is just to play devil's advocate though. Like Ooh. there is doing something that you're good at is much more enjoyable. Yes. Mm. You know, so like I notice how much more I enjoy drawing now than I did 15 years ago because yeah. I'm much better at it now than I was then. So it doesn't feel like, oh, there's this disconnect between my brain and my hand. Mm. Like I can picture what I want to draw, but my hand's just not doing it. Mm-hmm. And that, mm. you know, builds frustration. And, of course, like you have to just continue doing that and being frustrated to get better. But then also like particularly with kids, at what point are you like, cool, we're teaching, like, this is a valuable lesson. It Like, you just have to be shit for a bit and it's going to be annoying to get to that point where you're good at it and so you can enjoy it more. But just, or just making someone do something that they actually don't like. Don't enjoy. And to yeah. tell the difference between those things, I think, must be really hard for both the kid and the parent. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you like something and you're bad at it or you're, you're you know, at the start of your learning journey with it and you can still find joy in it then, well, that's ideal, you know, that's yeah. great. But how do you know if you're just like not into something that much mm. or you're just, yeah, you know, telling yourself that because you don't want to put in the hours to get better at it? Absolutely. I tried yeah, yeah. like every musical instrument under the sun and it was definitely the latter. Like yeah. I, just, <laughs> I just didn't want to do the work. I'm like I just want to be Jimi Hendrix now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to play Bar Bar Black Sheep. <laughs> it's not cool. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe that links back to what you were saying, Nat, about kind of naivete and like that's almost a superpower. I think that's why it's so kids have this beautiful window of just being like too dumb to know that they're bad at it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And that gets them through. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And then there are things that, you know, I'm only 35, there are so many things that I still want to learn and try, but to have that excruciating self-awareness of um, not only your skill level, but also to constantly wrestle with the knowing that you might be perceived in a particular way or perceived as being unskillful or whatever, um, and also being adult and self-aware enough to know that nobody's really looking at you, no one's perceiving you in any way, they're all thinking about themselves, um, <laughs> is, a, is a kind of ongoing battle once you're older. Um, it is, you know, wonderful to be blithely unaware. 
Yeah. Do you have any hobbies or um, I feel I always feel weird about the word hobby. Just side mm. note, I feel like it's such a diminishing word, but I don't have anything <laughs> okay. better. Like yeah. interests or things that you do outside of outside of painting mm. that bring you joy that you're maybe bad at? Like what are the things <laughs> that you're enjoying being bad at right now? Oh, uh, look, I'm a shit hiker. I love it. <laughs> like, how does get, one be a shit hiker though? <laughs> you're really unfit. <laughs> um, you I'm forget to pack just snacks. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm also a very bad runner and I just sort of seem to plateau at a particular fitness level or skill level where I love it and I will persist and I will keep doing it but I will get red-faced, I will get puffed out, I will be completely inelegant in every <laughs> conceivable <laughs> way. Um, but I love it. I love it so much. So, I mean, things like uh, th- things like any kind of sport or exercise are things that I've only recently come to um, and, you know, possess no innate skills. Um, but I've found that they're, God, they're so good for my mental health I'm that just- it overrides everything else yeah it's, yeah um but yeah skillless <laughs> there's a poverty <laughs> of skill absolutely yes. but can't I catch a ball with, yeah <laughs> like with something like hiking though I think like okay like you maybe you'll enjoy it more as you build a little bit more fitness and that sort mm. of a thing but like to me being bad at hiking would be being a nightmare to be around if you're with but other people complaining <laughs> like oh, and complaining yeah. a lot would make you bad at yeah, yeah. I think other right. than okay, that cool. like you know there's some room to choose right what kind of tracks you do and how long you take to do it mm. like and if the the intention for doing it just to in, enjoy yourself mm. then there's no real being bad at it other okay. than like if you were just horrific to be around. <laughs> that's, that's very comforting, I can't imagine actually. That, that you, that you would do that. I'm probably, I'm a silent hiker and that's partly because ah. it's very meditative and partly because I'm so puffed up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do, I'm probably not everyone's favourite hiking companion because I like to do it in silence. Um, I don't chat very much, but yeah, that's just preference, right? I think so. I'm the same, actually. I am so in the, the few times that I've gone for hikes with Dan and some of his friends, like he's got a small crew of people that go fairly regularly on, mm. you know, anything between like a day hike and a few nights away and stuff. Mm. I'm like, why would you sleep in a tent when you don't have to? <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like being physical and hiking and stuff. I'm like, I would also really like to like come back to a spa bar at the end of the day. But yeah. that's just me. But yeah, the times that we've done it and noticing our difference in preference for that so I'll be like a little bit behind and the same like really talking very very little and it's not because I don't enjoy the company of the people that I'm around but that's just how I like to do it and then Dan's really different and I think particularly you know it's a group of other dudes that do this together it's one of the only times that they you know they get to have a particular style of conversations like car Mm. conversations where you're facing the same direction you're not making direct eye contact you tend to have much more deep honest conversations and I think that Mm. is such an important part of hike the hiking experience to him Mm. that it's like not it's not been completed properly without that so I remember you know the few times that I've been with them um and Dan sort of being like oh like why are you like Come, come up with me, like come forward with us. I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm very happy here. Yeah. Um, but he's reading it as, you know, being detached or not happy or not included. Mm. But I'm like, no, this is my Present preference. in your own way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas for him it sounds like that's like that's his community. Mm. And, yeah. Are there, I mean, just turning the questions around. There. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have um, like hobbies or practices because this is, as a very solitary worker in many ways, um, community has kind of been at the forefront of my mind for a while, especially since being at the VCA where there was kind of an inbuilt community. Do you guys have practices or do, you, do your drawing and art practices build community for you? Do you have community around that or are there other ways that you you do that? Do you want to answer first, Alex? Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's such a um, timely question Mm -hmm. I think I've really been realizing like I'm struggling quite a lot at the moment with feeling isolated when I work Mm -hmm. um as someone who's worked as a freelance illustrator for more than a decade Mm -hmm. I kind of that just is the model of work for me like it is it is mainly just being by myself drawing yeah so I kind of didn't really have a different frame of reference but I think 
more and more I'm realizing like it just it I hate that so yeah. much I really hate it me it's, too <laughs> it's not good for me um and I think like probably this podcast has been one of the biggest um sort of the the counterweight to that it's been such an amazing excuse it's not only I get to see Jessamy a couple of times a week and have quality conversation with like our phones on airplane mode like actually just talking and the difference it's made to my overall happiness is huge yeah um and then there's kind of the additional level of we get the excuse to reach out and expand this idea of community to people who are just interesting and doing cool things in the world and and just good humans so like that's that's probably where I'm at like it's filling up the cup but I do think I need to I'm kind of waiting for the end of this year waiting to be finished my master's and I I need to redesign the way that my day-to-day work operates because it's just Mm. it's not good for me I I like fucking around like I was the person in class who like it didn't matter who I sat next to they would fail that subject (laughs) (laughs) but they were so happy we had so much fun like I just it's like built into my bones to fuck around and like and I love that I'm incredibly annoying in co-working spaces like this is a public and not like never share space with me because I just want to play Fantastic. Always. I'd love to not get work done at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take you up on that. Good. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I agree completely. It, it needs, it, I need more thought around it because I do, I mean, mm. jokes aside, like when I work, I, I do very deep work. But um, yeah, I need to find a way to design a day that is more um, nourishing in that kind of community sense because it, it is, it's mm. everything. Like more and more I'm just realizing, I guess the last two years as well, highlighted maybe for everyone like quite how important it is yeah absolutely and I mean the masters you really are thrown in with people that you've never met before Mm. and it's amazing how quickly community can develop just from having even remotely like minds and that was a huge kind of revelation for me I was like I don't have to sort of be friends with people already it's like I can just sort of walk into a room and 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 community is there yeah. and and everyone is kind of hungry for it people want to make friends yeah people want yeah. friendship yeah they do they want connection yeah and I think there's different kind of versions of community as well so in terms of like stuff outside of work I have very very strong close-knit community with my gym buddies oh, great. um <laughs> who I love and I see them every day of my life and we've spoken about this on the podcast before but at some point we sort of made that transition between gym friends to real friends. We all went to Bali on a holiday together. Like we're very, you know, um, locked in (laughs) now. And interestingly, a lot of that actually happened during the lockdowns when we couldn't, we weren't seeing each other and we'd had like started a a messenger group to um, coordinate when you're allowed to work out in small groups Mm. to coordinate that stuff and that group just sort of built and built and when that, um, common interest that we thought we were gathering around was taken away we were just left with a friendship and we were like ah well what do you know we're actual friends yeah um and so that is a very very strong community and because of the you know it's gym based everyone lives close to each other because for obvious reasons because we were going (laughs) to the same gym um so that's been incredibly special but then more sort of um work-based communities um have been wonderful and, and in a slightly different way. So um, I think as graphic recorders, we're quite lucky. And I feel like this is where I probably differ a little bit to you guys because I'm not an art an artist with my own arts practice. Like what I do is a, a service. Mm. So it's quite different in that sense. Um, but the community, like the global community of graphic recorders, the local community, the community that we set up with Graphic Recorders Australia, which is a professional membership association started in 2019, um, a small group of us, um, is incredibly supportive, generous, really good communicators. A lot of those connections exist online. Yep. Though, so it's not like it's working in a space with people or seeing people a lot, but it is feeling like very connected and supported. Yeah, which is really important. That's still very possible to feel connected and supported yeah. purely online, especially these days. Yeah, um, totally. 
it frees people up a lot as well Um, because, you know, everyone has so many time commitments and things Mm. like that, that seeing people in person is tricky. Are you, Um, are you sharing studio space with people? Like are you, when you paint, mm. is that, is that very alone or is that, do you get a bit of? Um, I've done a variety of things. So um, for a few years I shared with a very neat, botanical artist which was kind of hilarious we had to like really cordon off the space down the middle oh like siblings um, like you have to <laughs> yeah. draw the line yeah. just make sure um, the toilet is on your side <laughs> she was amazing and so beautiful and understanding it was more that I was terrified that I was going to transgress yeah. across into her space and besmirch yeah, her work yeah. you know like she did not need any splashes of neon red on her wattle or whatever um, and I really loved having I loved having companionship um, in my studio and similarly at VCA I loved that there were people around. Um, currently I'm in a <laughs> windowless shoebox in Collingwood <laughs> um, but there are people I know in the same warehouse so, you know, I can um, go up for a wander and, and see people if I mm. if I want to, um, if our schedules line up but I think it's still, it's still lacking something for me. Um, I really, like you, Alice, I think I want to kind of think about how I can design a more kind of proactively uh, community-oriented space to work in Um, going forward, um, something that sort of is more more nourishing, I guess. Um, Yeah, which is tricky to think about because you also need to get work done. And I am very head down, bum up when it comes to making work. So, yeah, but, um, but yeah, it's sort of, yeah. And and I'm introverted as well. So (laughs) just to add, um, yeah, add the icing to that sort of weird, complicated cake. But, um, yeah, so I don't know how it would work, but I am, I have an instinct that the situation I'm in right now needs to kind of be enhanced or bedded somehow. Mm. Yeah. We're really feeling the weight of the fact that we need people, right, mm. even if you think that you don't. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we were like, oh, no, when it's taken away, no, yeah. I really, really, really do. Yeah. yeah. I started doing this practice when I write and it's such a small thing but I found it hugely helpful when I'm working home alone and I need to, like, focus on a task that is is maybe, like, a bit challenging and I, I am just such a baby. I'm like, but I just want someone next to me. It's like doing my tax. I'm like, I'll do it. But I just want a, I just want someone sitting <laughs> next buddy. to me. They don't even have to do anything. Yeah. Um, but I also recognize I can't keep shipping in adult people <laughs> who have better things to do with their time to just sit next to me and give me like emotional support. So what I've started doing is just lighting a candle next to my computer when I work. Mm. And I find just that flame, it's just life. Mm. And there's like another life in the room with me. And it is, it's like made a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me (laughs) because. No, I love that. Yeah. I I think you were misinterpreting my look at you like you're crazy with like, I'm looking at you with love and admiration because that's beautiful. No, it is beautiful. I think I was feeling self-conscious because it feels like quite a, I I don't know, it feels like quite cheesy. Oh, dude, I talked to my compost. Come on. (laughs) You're fine. <laughs> You're in the right spot. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I feel so safe. But space is another kind of companionship as well. I mean, I think we really underestimate how much the spaces we're in come to be physical and emotional companions, like containers for the experiences we have. I think it makes a lot of sense to create spaces to work that feel like mm. companions or that they could hold companions um, yeah. securely. Um yeah, no, I'm with you. I am very particular about my writing space. Painting space, not so much. Just give me a box and I'll fill it. And I'll, I'll make it horrendously messy in about three seconds. But when I'm, yeah, when I'm writing or even when I'm drawing, I'm much more particular. How did you, how did you find the transition, speaking of the relationship between space, company, community, companionship, and kind of autonomy. Mm. How did you find moving from a share house? And I would imagine that's some kind of community, maybe or mm-hmm. not, that you may have had there into a space with a partner and then eventually a child as well. Like in what 
how would you describe those like shifts? The shifts. Um, well, in the share house I was in, which was like the last cheap cash in hand share house in Clifton Hill. It was, <laughs> Good it for was, you. That's mm. not, side note, I live in a share house in Clifton Hill. So this oh, story okay. is, oh, okay. and also used to be married no longer. So this is hey. very relatable content Excellent. right now. All right. Well, any <laughs> expanding I can do for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I moved into the share house after I got divorced with um, two very dear male friends of mine who I'm partly sure moved in with me because they really pitied the situation I was in but also it was extremely cheap and hard to pass up um and so that was a really warm and beautiful share house and for them all like uh we had a few sort of changes in people but for the entire time it was me and this very uh dear friend of mine um and then we hit lockdown um And it was kind of at a time when things felt like they were ready to change and I'd been feeling that for a while but kind of resisting it. And that first lockdown, um, my housemate was very unhappy in his job and was struggling a little bit and I was struggling with not having a lot of human contact, physical contact, and very physical, very affectionate. Um, And all of that kind of made me realise that I was in fact ready for a a kind of change of pace and for my the shape of my life to kind of look different and feel different. Um, that said, still in Clifton Hill, I only moved around the corner. <laughs> so we live near each other. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're going to be getting messages for Yay. dog walks coming up. Oh, this my is God, so yes. exciting. Um, and it continue. I mean, I think... The, the common thread between both houses is that they were really warm and loving um, spaces to be in. And, um, oh, yeah, but the, the share house also, you know, had some issues with mould and things like that. And I was like, okay, this is really the kick up the bum. Like, <laughs> let's get out of here. Um, and so I feel like in terms of community, not a lot has changed like I live with my partner in a almost a similar way like we have our own practices he makes knives in our backyard um and I draw and go to my studio and and then we come together to talk about what we're doing and and his daughter is um you know she's now older so she's she's almost a teenager so she's sort of doing her own thing but she's also kind of tangentially involved and what we're doing and and so there's a similar kind of pattern of of sharing time and sharing our feelings and sharing our our space that I I have had in the best of the share houses Mm. that I've lived in um and it doesn't feel like a kind of traditional sort of narrow domestic arrangement it feels like one that we've kind of built from scratch for ourselves to suit us um, much like you might in a share house. So, mm. yeah, so I would say that um, in a lot of ways it's really kind of built my feeling of having a community and having a mm. even more, even though it's it's a domestic arrangement. Yeah. 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 Those relationships have, can be very, very special and very deep, can't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Natalie, unfortunately we need to start winding it up, but I have got oh. like a, a literal page full of things that I wanted to ask you about. <laughs> Please come back. So I'll just, I'll choose Anytime. one. Anytime. Anytime. But, um, but before you got here, Alice had forwarded me your email newsletter that you send out and oh, I was like, this chick is going to be amazing and she's speaking straight to my soul. Um, but you, you spoke sort of at the start of this episode a little bit about how your definition of success has evolved and now you're seeing success more as the the bigger picture Mm, as opposed to you know um really defined measures of success yeah um and in this beautiful newsletter and we'll post um with your permission natalie we'll post a link to it in the episode notes and i I highly encourage you to go and read it because and it's, it's only short but it's a very very beautiful piece of writing that um i related to hard um and a lot of it was around self-sabotage yeah um 
which is an incredibly interesting topic, I think. Um, and one thing you mentioned in there was having a fear, realizing that you had a fear of both failure and success. Mm, yes. So I, I'd love for, you know, as a way of kind of rounding things out and wrapping things up for you to talk to us a little bit about your experience of that and, sure. and where you're at with it now. Sure. And I will feel a little vulnerable with this because, you know, there's, uh, I don't know if it's cultural or whatever, but there's a long tradition as um, cis woman and Australian, all of these things to not toot your own horn too much. And I'm, but I'm going to to it. Proceed to. anyway. <laughs> um, the fear of success thing kind of blindsided me a couple of years ago in some therapy sessions because, you know, you think that you self-sabotage because you don't want to fail. And then at a certain point I realised that I'm afraid of what success can bind you to. Um, mm. So I perceived success as entailing more work not necessarily work I wanted to do, um, success as uh, entailing more scrutiny, more attention, um, to be kind of uncomfortably in a spotlight um, that is, and that's something that I'm, that it has been my focus for this year actually is to try to teach myself how to be comfortable with being seen, um, which is a really big, big topic and I've, been unpacking that a lot and success is part of that. How do you sit comfortably with the possibility that there's kind of no, there's no upper limit or end or known outcome or to success? I mean, failure, you know that you, you're at a certain point, you're going to hit bedrock and bounce up again, um, pr you know, probably. Um, but success can kind of take can manifest as almost anything. It's entirely unpredictable. We've just come through a couple of years where we've grappled with the kind of endless confrontation with the unknown and uncertainty and ambiguity. And so I'm sure it's part of that, but also it's like, <laughs> and this is where the tooting the horn comes in. I'm like, I think I just fear how powerful I could be. Do yeah. other people fear that? Like is that, like we're kind of uh, untapped, all of us, as far as like how much power we and autonomy we can exert in our own lives, how completely open to change and design our lives can be I and that openness is saying. terrifying. <laughs> love you for saying that and I see now why that would have felt that feels vulnerable and scary to say but it, it it, it's like the vertigo of possibility yes yeah that's it exactly it's really always uh feeling unsteady yeah because of the the sheer endlessness of your own possibilities and knowing that you're the auteur of mm. that um <laughs> and with that comes such a responsibility such because a huge now responsibility. now it's on you to make those choices and and if you don't that's on you as well yeah. and that's where the self-sabotage piece comes in it's mm. like you can hold yourself back as much as you want as well like that is also <laughs> open and changeable mm. um and it's like everything we've kind of talked about it's practice I'm bad at being seen I'm bad at advocating for, or striving for my own success because I fear it and I have to practice <laughs> and I have to be a bit shit at it for a while. <laughs> and how are you going about that practice at the moment? Now? Um, it's about, for me, it's actually about kind of going back into community a little bit. Um, it's about talking to other people, letting people know that I exist, that mm -hmm. I'm as interested in them as I am because I think often people don't want to hear that i love them and I want to know more about them and you know I'm like well, that's a bit much um <laughs> so it's being practicing being comfortable with maybe being a bit much and accepting that for people for whom that is too much where they're like whoa you know you don't I don't want to tell you about me I don't want you to be part of my my community or whatever that they're just not my people that's okay yeah. and and opportunities for success that fall through or people who judge me for for wanting to kind of 
learn how to be more powerful and autonomous, people who aren't comfortable with that, again, are just not for me and I'm not for them. Yeah. <laughs> Probably all boils down to people pleasing really and jettisoning the whole people pleasing mm. practice as you get older. Yeah. That yeah. is such a liberating thing, isn't it, when you realise mm. that there's not necessarily, there doesn't have to be something wrong or bad about someone for you to not get along or even not, mm. not get along, but you know what I mean? You're just like it's some people are like, I know I'm not for everyone. That's that's it. fine. Yeah. That's great. I would never have that expectation of someone. Of that they the... have to love me. <laughs> I mean, they should. <laughs> they obviously <laughs> should. If they know what's good for them, That's right. they will. <laughs> I've only met you once, but I'm on board. Um, <laughs> Back at um, you, babe. The, uh, yeah, I mean, the, of the, all the wise philosophers, um, I think Dita Von Teese really nailed it. Um, <laughs> she's like, you know, you can be the juiciest, ripest peach in the world, but somebody's not going to like peaches. And I'm like, well, shit, didn't that <laughs> yeah. just... <laughs> Well, I actually think that's a beautiful note to leave it on. <laughs> Quote by the wonderful Miss Dita Von Teese. And th- thank you, Natalie, so much for your generosity and your vulnerability. And I know that some of these things are really uncomfortable to talk about and I really, really appreciate um, you doing it and and um, by extension making other people feel less alone. That's why we're here. Thank you so much for having me. This has been beautiful. It's so. been such a joy. I'm feeling, I feel like my insides are just all warm tea uh, ready. Oh. I'm so excited and there's so many more conversations I want to have with you. I am absolutely oh, yes. going to be contacting you oh, for yes. many dog. I had no idea that you lived around no, the corner. No, me neither. And good luck getting, <laughs> getting away from me. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you, Jessamy. Thanks, gorgeous Alice, gorgeous Natalie. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Imposter Syndrome Club. Please follow us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're feeling extra kind, rates and review. Or if you got any insights or value from this, share with a friend. You can also find us on Instagram at ImpostorPod or online at ImpostorSyndromeClub.com. 